How can I turn the transcription off? Do you know? It's so annoying. Or do I just close the... I guess I just close. I don't know. I don't see it. Okay, so welcome everyone and thank you for joining us this late. Uh, today's webinar will be presented by Ms. Misan Tuhi on critical pedagogy. Ms. Misan, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you for joining everybody. Good evening and welcome. This is our second webinar for this semester and I'm really grateful that so many of you showed up uh, this late. Um, may I kindly ask that all microphones be switched off so that we can hear each other clearly, please? I can hear my echo, so some microphone is on. Uh, anyway, so critical pedagogy, um, some of us might have some background about this and some of us may not. For those of you who do, I would like your opinion and your input. For those of you who don't, um, maybe it's something to reflect on, to learn, and to adopt if you like it. So um, the idea of this um, webinar uh, came forth uh, from one of the courses I was taking, from one of the course papers I was writing, and also when I recently, in August uh, 2022, the uh, Ministry of Education issued an updated code of conduct for educational professionals in the UAE that kind of capitalizes on um, values such as, um, sorry, um, honesty and sincerity, trust and integrity, equity and equality, which are going to be very big titles for us today, compassion and tolerance, which is something that um, is uh, frequently um, mentioned uh, as a very important value in every facet of our living here in the UAE because of the diverse society and of course, uh, respect, which um, manifests itself in every uh, also day, everyday experiences for us. The second um, you know, slide I wanna show you on this as well is that the same values are kind of mentioned uh, and have been, you know, so the, the code of conduct is kind of new and updated, but these values are not new because they have forever been posted on the United Arab Emirates Ministry of Education you can see the first um, um, uh, num the first bullet in the strategic objectives is actually ensure exclu uh, inclusive quality of education. We're going to talk a lot about the meaning of inclusivity when it comes to diversity. And then if you um, uh, drop down a little, number four, ensure safe, conducive, and challenging learning environments. And... Um, I need to remove this little bar right here, which is kind of blocking my view. Um, strengthening the uh, quality of education in general. So uh, by the end of this presentation, I don't really have uh, measurable uh, outcomes, learning outcomes from this presentation, just probably food for thought. So I hope to make you think of some elements by the end of this presentation. Um, you might not want to think about anything at all because what I'm telling you today is a suggestion and definitely not an imposition. So you might want to adopt a laissez-faire approach to teaching and learning, and that also has its, its very many strengths. But also, I'm giving you the option of becoming a critical pedagogue. Um, I want you to think of your teacher identity and your positionality in your current workplace context. Identity and positionality are concepts that we will talk about later in this presentation. I would like you to think of your teacher role beyond the word teacher and the word researcher. Uh, there's a typing mistake here. It should be researcher. So this is in line with directives from the Dean of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, uh, which uh, he highlighted in the meeting we had with him at the beginning of the semester. Um, I would like you to think of your classrooms are space. I would like you to think of your classrooms as spaces of difference, which can represent a chance for promoting equity and hopefully giving the chance to the people involved in the educational um, uh, or the learning experience to take this fair experience in the classroom and um, um, make the world a little fairer. 
And finally, I would like you to think of ways to identify hegemonic facets of learning, teaching, and being, and to develop practical ways to counter things that are kind of unjust or uh, hegemonic or stereotypical or stigmatizing. Um, so I have about 20 slides, but don't be scared. The last slide is the references. Some of these slides we will skate over quite quickly. And for others, they're going to be a pit stop for us to talk. And you're welcome to kind of interject anytime. If you want to give a comment, raise your hand, type in the chat. Um, I will be asking some rhetorical questions, but if you would like to answer and contribute to your experience, we would love to hear from you during or after the presentation. So I will start by describing the UOS classroom or the UAE classroom as I perceive it, as literature perceives it, and maybe as you perceive it. And if you perceive it differently, I'm very happy to hear from you. So diversity in the US classroom can take many forms. People, our, our learners or our students, which are words I will be using interchangeably, they, they, they identify as peoples from different races. They come from different cultures. N many of them are actually multicultural themselves. So they, they come from different cultures. Uh, they speak different languages. Uh, uh, those studying in Arabic speak many dialects and varieties of Arabic. Many of them speak many dialects and varieties of English. Urdu, uh, uh, French. So we have diversity when it comes to the uh, languages our students speak. Our students also come from very diverse socioeconomic backgrounds. Uh, we do have uh, students of uh, different abilities. So there's a spectrum of mental abilities, psychological abilities, physiological abilities, etc. We have gifted students who might require a different type of attention than the student whom we consider as mainstream students, among other ways that diversity can manifest itself in our classroom. So here, here is some uh, food for thought for all of us. And um, I would like to hear from you. Um, how did your, something to think about, okay? So taking this diversity into consideration, how did your education, training as an educator or a student and experience prepare you or shape you in ways that allow you to respond to challenges that this diversity may pose? So uh, I will give a lot of specific examples uh, in about 10 minutes, but I would like you to think about how uh, your background as an educator, your education, your experience in the classroom or outside the classroom has made you able or unable even to address some challenges that diversity may pose in the classroom. Just something to think of. Hi. How, would, you, would you like to speak? Yeah, actually I grew up in Kuwait. I was born in Kuwait and Kuwait is a very diverse, uh, uh, like, you know, uh, culture and society. No. And this enabled us to meet people from different cultures and be very open-minded. You know, so when like when I think about my students, I think about them in the same manner um, that I did. Like when I was in school in Kuwait, I had friends from different cultures, so they're just the same. So I'm just like accepting. And this has nothing to do with my values. Yani, there is like I can separate between my values and people's values. So it doesn't mean that I like, you know, there's this dilemma kind of conflict between what you believe is right and how you perceive others. So I think this made me um, more accepting. Similarly, when I spent some time in Canada, where, you know, Canada is also another multicultural society and where you have to do that by law, you know? Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so excellent uh, um, point, Mr. Tuhir, and I would like to capitalize on the word acceptance which is at the heart of what I'm really trying to say and which is the conclusion we're going to make out of this presentation, hopefully at the end. Uh, Dr. Najib, thank you so much for the uh, um, message you typed in the chat. Absolutely, this is something we should think of. Thought control, right? So creating some sort of unjust uh, uh, opportunities in the classroom by thought control. So let's move on from here. Um, so. What does the literature say about diversity and its affordances versus its challenges? 
So when we talk about the word diversity, many of us might perceive this as something that is always positive, as something that is always something beautiful in the classroom, that is always improving and contributing positively to the classroom experience. This is not true because diversity, if not addressed um, uh, and understood correctly by everyone in the learning experience, teachers and students alike, may pose some challenges. Uh, what does the literature say? So teachers find it hard sometimes to address diversity in the classroom because of the following reasons. And I mentioned the sources at the end. Um, first, in their teacher education programs where they were trained to become teachers, uh, teachers were offered, ver offered very brief intercultural or, or multicultural communication courses. These communication courses uh, say, you know what, people come from different places, they have different music, different clothes, different food, different languages, celebrate them. Uh, a, a typical example is uh, if anybody here is teaching uh, technical writing, we have uh, at the end of chapter two in technical writing, we have a section on intercultural communication. Ms. Dana, would you like to, uh, who's speaking? Uh, somebody's speaking and I want to listen to you, but I don't see who you are. So I'm sorry. At the end of our um, technical writing book, there, there was a section that was probably revised in the new version of the book because uh, it, it presented kind of very stereotypical information about people from different cultures that sounded kind of not always positive. Teachers also complain about diversity because they are uh, uh, given limited special education courses in their teacher education program. So unfortunately, in a lot of teacher education programs, unless you train to become exclusively a special educator, they give you maybe one course on special education and it's many times an elective and not a requirement. Teachers complain that uh, they are trained to celebrate diversity, but not to address the challenges that uh, arise or may arise from it. There are injustices that may arise. So uh, 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 teachers report that there are injustices and challenges that can arise from diversity and uh, um, they learn after they leave the university and become practicing teachers, they come to learn that there is this divide between theory and practice. There is a, a big divide between graduating, from, uh, between what they learn at the university and what they see in their practice. And they learn that teaching, especially the teaching of language is not really neutral. There are elements of power, there are elements of authority, there are elements, teaching is not a neutral activity. This is what the literature reports. So, um, more about teachers self-report on classroom diversity. So Ms. Suhair uh, mentioned the word acceptance. Acceptance is great because it means recognizing difference uh, um, between if, if a teacher is kind of always checking in regarding, well, this is who my learners are, this is who X is, this is who Y is, this is who A is, this is who B is, and this is who I am. However, it's not always, so I said that many times when we think about diversity, we are thinking about something positive. We are thinking about a, a, a spectrum of cog cognitive abilities an immensity of culture and knowledge that every single person in the learning uh, experience is bringing to this little classroom, uh, to this little room in which we are meeting. But there are challenges that arise. They might not arise so often, but a, a teacher should be prepared when they arise and to address them. And these challenges become dangerous when they pose bigger problems, such as problems that violate all the values that we have spoken about at the very beginning. So the challenges that may arise from diversity in the classroom become dangerous when they violate the value of equality, when they uh, violate the value of respect, when they uh, uh, um, perpetuate stereotypes, when they create a pyramid in the classroom of power, where some people are empowered and some people are disempowered. So teachers self-report on classroom diversity. Uh, in our cell study, teachers reported being not so comfortable with diversity. Uh, in Bartholomew's uh, study, uh, teachers like would have liked to have more uh, 
um, uh, life experience and histories in common with their students. Uh, also, uh, teachers complained that they don't have the time and the energy and the resources to attend to minority or vulnerable students and uh, under vulnerable students, gifted students are mentioned. In Bahizdada's et al. study, uh, teachers reported confusion, depersonalization, which means kind of detachment from the learning experience, stress and uncertainty that might arise from diversity. And in conclusion, all of these studies concluded that uh, many teachers lacked training to address negative uh, um, uh, consequences that might arise from diversity in, in the classroom. So how can we convert this into something positive? Let's see. One way to address these challenges that arise or that might arise, okay? I don't wanna exaggerate. I wanna say, okay, so in, in one in every 100 classes we give, maybe an incident will happen and what should we do? So one way to address the challenges that arise from diversity is training to become or to be a critical pedagogue. Uh, what is a, who is a critical pedagogue and what is critical theory really? Critical theory is rooted in the work of uh, Paulo Freire who is actually a Brazilian philosopher and who uh, identified as a person who cares to make this world a little more just, a little more fair a little more equal, a little more uh, recog recognizant, maybe? Does this word exist? <laughs> okay. Cognizant, maybe a little more cognizant of um, difference in a positive sense, not in a negative sense. So critical theory uh, kind of uh, says that there are injustices going on in the world. There are dehumanizing practices going on in the world and they uh, are, perpetuated uh, in the classroom because the classroom, especially the diverse classroom, can be a mini globe. Uh, it's bringing peoples from all over the world into the same learning experience. Examples of injustice that I will mention later in detail are accent hierarchies, gender power inequalities, and some dehumanizing practices that might happen in the classroom are some online learning and teaching experiences where both the learners and the students are kind of treating each other like a machine rather than uh, human beings who are trying to communicate through a machine. Uh, Majdulin, I wanna read your comment. I think for people who have lived in the UAE for a long time, we got used to always having multiple cultures around us, whether in the classroom or not, so it becomes the norm. This is a very good point, Majdulin, because um, it's about sensitization, right? So for a person who has always lived in a homogeneous monolingual society, diversity might be a surprise, might be a challenging situation, but definitely you are perfectly right to think that the more, yeah, the, the, the more exposure, the more we learn, right? This is what I'm trying to say. The more we are exposed to this diversity, the more we learn how to become better learners and teachers and how to minimize conflict and maximize the positive uh, um, fruits we can reap from the diversity in our classrooms. Let's leave that until I reach the recommendations. Criticality can be defined. So what is criticality and what is and who is a critical pedagogue? Criticality can be defined, defined as the importance of holding a rigorous ethical position towards identifying, alerting to, and challenging social injustice in its many forms. So whenever you see injustice, what do you want to do about it? You're, you, you're not going to uh, uh, do anything that is going to make an already bad situation worse, but there are some mini steps maybe you can take dipl diplomatically uh, uh, with great conflict resolution skills. Maybe with little steps, uh, we can make this world a better place. I don't know. I'm hopeful. Criticality in education or critical pedagogy, what does it mean? It means challenging mainstream approaches that reproduce unjust social power structures. Recognizing or being um, uh, critically aware of injustices and thinking about small, little, tiny little steps and initiatives a teacher or a learner can do in order to make the classroom more just, make the learning experience more just and more conducive to learning and hopefully taking this experience outside the classroom and improving whatever is happening in the world. 
Uh, criticality asks you to move from problem posing education to problem solving education. What is problem posing education? Problem posing education uh, celebrates an acceptable, I'm not saying there is a right approach and the wrong approach here. I'm saying here are some examples of approaches, see which one you would like to adopt. So problem posing education adopts a traditional banking model of teaching and learning. What is the banking model teaching and learning? It's like you took some money and you put it in the bank. The teacher gives uh, content information to students. Students memorize this content. They are not necessarily critical about it. They are expected to write it in a test and then life is beautiful. Uh, this uh, um, a, a approach to education uh, adopts a one size fits all. And this is where diversity becomes a problem. What if you are adopting one size fits all, but there are learners in the classroom that require an alternative? We are all, yani, with experience, we become more attentive to different learning styles and uh, different uh, needs. Problem solving education, on the other hand, which is what a critical pedagogue practices, attends to student diversity, gives students authority and agency, Makes them, a dis, uh, makes them decision makers in the educational experience and designs a personalized learning experience based on needs assessment. Now, this may be possible, and sometimes it's not really possible, right? We cannot personalize a, a, a lesson for every single student in a huge class, but we can explain something in two different ways so that to reach uh, more uh, students with different learning styles. Moving on, what are values that critical pedagogues foster? Definitely the same values that are encouraged and promoted and celebrated in the Code of Conduct for Teachers in the UAE and on the Ministry of Education website, autonomy. Yani, I don't think any student will be sad if their students became a little more autonomous. This is actually our duty, in my opinion, and from a critical pedagogue perspective. Uh, um, a teacher should eventually teach a students how to learn on their own. We see our students for a limited amount of time. We are with them for a limited amount of time. If they want to become lifetime, lifetime learners, they need to learn how to learn alone or on their own. Uh, critical pedagogues foster responsibility. Critical pedagogues also foster equality when it comes to race, when it comes to language. And we're going to talk about this uh, more later. So this is a, a quotation. Uh, that is important. A, uh, a critical pedagogy engages teachers in critical examination of the systematic influence of power, oppression, dominance, inequity, and justice on all aspects in all aspects of education. A critical pedagogue is informed by a principled ethics of compassion and social justice based on solidarity. So it's not an imposition. This is what I'm trying to say. It's uh, just, um, yes, uh, uh, Dr. Sharif, Please. Oh, he's, well, he wants to be admitted. Uh, somebody raised their hand. Would you like to speak? I don't know who raised their hand. OK, I'm sorry. All right, cool. So, um, so um, a critical pedagogue reaches out to other uh, uh, um, participants in the learning experience in order to, together, identify ways to make the learning experience a little more just, make it uh, 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 fair, and to apply that uh, in teaching and learning. Uh, value, more values uh, um, linked to criticality or critical pedagogy, inclusion, intersectionality of identity, which means um, our identity is multiple, okay? So me. Misan, what is my identity? I'm an English teacher, but I'm also a student. I am also a woman. I am from uh, this particular culture. This, these are the languages I speak. This is my age. I belong to this particular age group. I belong to DFL. DFL belongs to the College of, uh, of Humanities and et cetera, et cetera. This is what I mean when I say intersectionality of identity. Uh, we exist in, in multiple, um, you know, elements that kind of define us. Uh, also, uh, 
values of criticality are an inward view. So I'm always thinking where I stand, what am I doing, what, what I'm doing, uh, um, is this just, is this fair? I'm always self-evaluating and self-assessing and outward view. I'm always thinking of contextual factors, which are, uh, which can have affordances and limitations. So I'm always taking the context and the, uh, the physical context into uh, consideration. Where are you? In which place are you? Which country? In which uh, um, uh, culture? What are things that are permissible in this culture? What are things that are taboo in this culture, et cetera? So that's respect. And we saw respect as one of the core values of the code of conduct also at the beginning. So more food for thought. <laughs> Sorry. All right. What knowledge and values do I, as a teacher, bring to the classroom? What do I embody? What do I mean? What, how am I perceived by myself, by others? What are the possible consequences of my thoughts, words, and actions on the learning and teaching process for the learners, for me, for my institution, for the community? Today, my students were complaining that uh, timing for a test was very uh, little. And I thought that it was very just. Uh, it, was very, it's, it was enough. I thought it was enough. So tonight, I will be self-assessing of whether I, I'm being fair, literally, whether the time was enough or not enough. For an experienced teacher, the answer kind of is easier. But for a new teacher, it might be tricky. They might think twice, right? I don't know if you agree with me or not. You don't have to, okay? So uh, here's the first example I wanna give you. Uh, this is from my everyday practice, okay? I teach English for medical sciences. I teach technical writing. I, I've taught almost every service course in um, DFL. So pronouns in medicine, gender stereotypes when it comes to a particular profession. Most of my students, if not all of them, every time they mention a doctor, they're always thinking he. Every time they mention a writer, they're always thinking he. It gets a little worse when students are conducting uh, uh, external research, you know, on their on U.S. library libraries uh, page in the databases or on Google Scholar, because we use last names, uh, you know. Now, first names can be gender neutral, of course, but when you when you use last names and you want to refer to an author, it becomes a little trickier. So students think, yeah, it's easy to just use he. So I'm always finding it that for a more just world to women. You should always draw students' attention that doctors can be women, writers can be women, while in other professions that are typically, stereotypically female, you should always draw their attention that they should be using she, they, uh, sorry, he. So I always tell them, use gender neutral uh, uh, pronouns when you don't know if the writer is a he or a she, when you don't know if the doctor is a he or a she. Little steps, okay? Sensitization, raising critical awareness. This is what a critical pedagogue does. We are not changing the world overnight, but there are little things you can do. I'm sure, I don't know. Think about it. Another example is about accent hierarchies. When we were, uh, when we were giving face-to-face -face classes, uh, I had a student in class who spoke English with a certain accent, uh, you know, although I believe that all English, world Englishes are accented wherever you come from, even language, whether you're a native speaker or a non-native speaker, there is always an accent. I'm Lebanese, we, we speak a, a different, uh, even my Lebanese is, is so many, it's not only one accent of, of Lebanese Arabic. So um, I had the critical incident in class where I easily understood the student and what he was saying, but uh, his classmates were making fun of him because they couldn't, uh, um, understand what he was saying okay uh, and they, nobody knew nobody asked we don't ask people where you, where do you come from necessarily you can there's nothing wrong with that question we celebrate diversity we ce celebrate where our students come from etc but i i got the impression that the students were n n not really appreciating that person's accent and although his accent was perfectly intelligible i could perfectly understand what he was saying so I felt the need to clarify that, you know, um, people speak any language with an accent and it's not an, a, a, a reason for ridicule. It's not a reason for, for laughing. 
it's not, uh, you know, so this is also one way something can be addressed. Uh, accent hierarchies are real. If you're interested, you can read De Costa and Norden. Uh, it's actually cited at the end of today's presentation. And um, unfortunately, some social st st statuses, some stereotypes, uh, some power differences are associated uh, uh, favoring some accents over others, while really accents mean nothing. They don't mean anybody is less intelligent. They don't mean anything is less knowledgeable. They don't mean anybody, uh, anybody, I'm sorry, I'm saying anything. They don't mean anybody is less powerful, less knowledgeable, less intelligent, less uh, of anything, less of a human, okay? Uh, the last critical uh, incidents I wanna um, uh, mention are actually two studies. Uh, these two researchers, Johnson and Golombek, uh, use uh, what we call um, uh, critical reflection. So they publish a lot about the importance for any teacher to engage in explicit cl critical uh, uh, reflection and to write about their experiences as teachers, both positively and negatively, and to publish this writing for other teachers to benefit from their experience. So. Uh, here are some examples of critical pedagogues in writing. So uh, in Johnson's article, Johnson is talking about how native speakers of English are always perceived to have better grammar. So uh, maybe, um, this is what the article says, this is not my opinion. So uh, Johnson uh, uh, did a study uh, or wrote on herself uh, when she was reflecting on some students she was teaching. These students are actually uh, were uh, uh, teacher candidates training to become teachers of English. She noticed from her experience with a group of students that uh, uh, students who spoke English as a native, uh, uh, as native speakers whose, whose first language was English, whose native language was English, found it harder to teach English grammar compared to students who were non-native speakers. Why? Native speakers applied rules naturally and you know without thinking about these rules without thinking why do we say uh, uh, i just finished uh, cooking studying and cleaning so a group of students who are actually uh, uh, native speakers of english were not able to explain to their students the parallel structure rule in grammar while a group of nat uh, non-native speakers were actually very e uh, very uh, easily able to do that so the concept of assuming that a native speaker is always the better teacher is something to question. Uh, no offense to anybody, okay? Um, uh, another example in uh, Golombek's article, again, the, Golombek is a critical pedagogue and she decided to critique herself. So she was looking at the comments that she left for some uh, stu uh, student teachers on their papers. So there, uh, there was this particular student, she's always uh, becoming a teacher. She was training to become a teacher. And Golombek noticed that every time she is leaving comments on the student's paper, these comments were actually mean, they were rude. So Golombek engaged in uh, critical reflection as a critical pedagogue and noticed that when she looks at the student, she perceives her as, as someone very sociable, uh, very friendly with everybody. And she noticed that this kind of people makes her uh, make her feel so this student was sociable and friendly with everybody and this made the teacher who is Golombek a little uncomfortable because Golombek herself was not really comfortable with people who are ultra sociable or art ultra friendly so then Golombek decided to that this is unfair as a teacher she's being unfair she's being uh, unjust and she decided to modify the way she gives feedback to the student, putting her own personal uh, impressions and prejudices aside. So what am I doing here? I'm giving you tiny little examples on how we can make this world a better place. <laughs> okay, it's a huge goal, but one little step at a time. I would love to hear about your experiences. So what are, after I, so I only have the recommendations left, okay? Um, are we good on time, Ms. Dana? Am I exceeding my time or am I good with time? I think I'm okay. Um, thank you. Okay, so only recommendations and limitations left. So 
Let's say one of you got inspired today and you wanna become a critical pedagogue, or one of you suddenly realized today that they are already a critical pedagogue. Hooray. Recommendations for practicing teachers, maybe also teachers who are learning to become teachers. Take your time. A critical pedagogy doesn't develop overnight. We will not learn how to become critical pedagogues overnight. We will never always be right. It's always trial and error. Let's see, you can try. Definitely be cautious, okay? You may have to just act on an opportunity that presents itself without prior planning, such as the example I gave you about accent hierarchies. Accept that even critical pedagogues may disagree among themselves and among each other. Why? Because we are trying to define very abstract concepts here. We are trying to define justice, power, equity, equality. These very abstract concepts may mean very different things to different people. Use critical incidents in class to raise critical awareness. In other words, I'm trying to tell you, tell your story. We might learn from each other. Understand the classroom as a space of uh, difference. Positive difference, and if this is a negative difference, decide what you want to do about it. Maybe you don't want to do, I told you from the very beginning, you can be totally laissez faire. There is no correct answer here. We are just seeing what's out there when it comes to ontologies and epistemologies and thinking, what am I, who am I as a teacher and as an educator? Identify classroom realities that have become normalized but should rather be problematized. What about online learning and teaching? Do you feel that this is dehumanized? How are you humanizing it? How can you add the human dimension? Utilize your and your students' identities, life histories, multiple realities, and experience at teaching and learning content. A lot of uh, scholars, such as Gloria Park, wrote extensively about how she became a critical pedagogue, eliciting experiences from her students. Engage students in the teaching and decision-making process. One way, one way you can make your classroom a little more just is to uh, uh, just engage your students, flatten these power structures between you and your students when you feel that you can, right? Not always, maybe, maybe gradually, maybe this is more ap applicable in graduate classes rather than undergraduate classes. Maybe this is more applicable in major courses rather than service courses. See what to do. Um, seek chances to inspire or encourage every participant in the learning process to become an advocate towards a more just world, one little step at a time. No quantum leaps. I don't know, maybe we're not, yeah, we, we, we're not likely to change the world in one second and make it, a, you know, a, a perfect, uh, you know, like sea of happiness. Look for opportunities to learn about transformative teaching and learning strategies. Reflect on stereotypes, stigma, uh, stereotype, uh, reflect on stereotypical, stigmatizing and dehumanizing biases and ideologies that one should unlearn. What's the origin? Why do people think that people who speak certain accents are less human, less worthy? Why are there these accent hierarchies? Where did they come from? Why should, not, why should we counter them? Why should we fight them? Assign critical reflections as graded or ungraded writing. Uh, you can use this as a participation grade if you don't want to grade it. Uh, learn about active listening, dialogue, negotiation, democracy, and conflict resolution, and teach these skills to your students through the course skills and the course content. You can always uh, 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 use uh, an approach, uh, a different approach to teach the same content. And this approach itself that you are teaching your students, especially if these students are training to become teachers, can be something that the students are learning apart from the content that they are learning. So you are teaching them a method and a content a strategy, an approach, and the content. Collaborate with colleagues, parents, and any larger community organizations whose values align with yours, whose values align with the, with the University of Sharjah, with UAE Ministry of Education, with UAE Community Society, government. Challenge accent hierarchies. Encourage yourself, your students, and your colleagues to experiment with multimodality. What is multimodality? Multimodality is not thinking about text as only numbers and letters. Think about text as video. Think about text as audio. Think about text as image. Open this world of opportunities to your students. Uh, maybe in EAP, if you want your students to write an introduction, let them get, grab a picture from the internet and write an introduction 
for an essay about this picture instead of giving them a prompt. Very easy and very simple steps can be taken. Remember that if you want to be more just, if you want to be more fairer, then a lot of students are visual learners. They are not textual learners. So by integrating multimodality and allowing multimodality, you are attending to different learning styles and thus you are making the learning experience a little more just. Promote translanguaging. What is translanguaging? Incorporating students' first language as a way uh, to honor, uh, of honoring and building on their existing knowledge, home culture and language skills. In the past, if we spoke Arabic in our English classroom, it used to be taboo. These days with the translanguaging movement, uh, uh, there is a, um, a certain uh, uh, ideology that uh, our native languages are actually resources that we can draw upon when we are learning a foreign language. So, you know, epistemologies really differ. You might believe in this, you might not believe in this. Again, I'm saying these are suggestions and not impositions. These are mentioned in the literature. Remind yourself continuously of your goals. Uh, we, we get to drown in a world of work, in a world of tasks, in a world of deadlines. And sometimes we, we lose touch with why we are teachers in the first place. So a more equal, equitable and tolerant society and continue, continuously revise your goals and align your curricula, content material and teaching approaches with them. Facilitate rather than impose a critical inward and outward view towards injustice so that you do not reproduce power imbalances. I am not here to tell you you should all become critical pedagogues because I am reproducing power. I'm, I'm, I'm practicing a power that I don't have in the first place. I don't have that power to impose it on anyone. So anything we propose is just a suggestion. Know when to complicate and problematize and when to simplify and ignore. This again takes me back to that laissez-faire argument. Keep up with the changes in the student demographic interests, challenges and needs. What might have worked for our students 10 and 20 years ago might will definitely not might not will definitely probably not most probably not work for our students today. What are the needs of this generation? Share your successful stories and maybe also the not so successful stories so that we can all learn from each other and publish your stories because a lot of journals nowadays welcome uh, uh, narrative inquiry where we read a story to learn a lesson about teaching and learning. What are limitations? And this is my last slide. Thank you so much for your patience. Uh, know the risks. <laughs> People may not share your values if you are a transformative educator. People may not condone your thoughts. People may not support your identity and your approaches as a transformative pedagogue. Be ready to be criticized, hopefully constructively. Know your context and your audience. Context sensitivity is very important. We all know that there are themes in this context that are not to be discussed and that are to be avoided. It's actually in the code of conduct that is published online. Students may be demotivated, disinterested, inhibit, inhibited or underestimated as far as engaging them in the learning process and in the decision-making process is concerned. Capitalize on their abilities, okay? They cannot not bring anything to the learning experience. They definitely bring something big or small. Capitalize on it if you want to share the power with them as a teacher and as an authority. And finally, be ready to be disappointed. Stereotypical scenarios might repeat themselves and sometimes efforts to promote justice are fruitless. At least you tried because hope floats, right? Thank you so much, everybody, for listening. And these are my references. I now welcome comments, and um, you can start to grill me. <laughs> uh, comments, um, anything you would like to say? Yeah, I just. Thank, thank you, Hassan. I just want to say, yeah. I'm listening, Ms. Suhair, and then probably Dr. Najib raised his hand. OK, no, then Dr. Najib will go first. <laughs> I'll go after Dr. Najib. Uh, Sorry, no, I go ahead, go ahead, finish your points. No, okay. I just wanted to say, no, Yani, these values are actually stand, like, you know, when you when you said don't make fun of someone because their accent is different or because they don't have the same power, these values are universal. So I think that although people know what's right, they choose to do the wrong. And as a teacher, you might have to set boundaries in class. 
and say, you know, like this is not acceptable. But and then again, yes, you raise awareness. But in our like situation with university students, the values are already there. You know, they're just at an age where change can be a little bit more difficult. Change of thoughts, I mean, not of behavior. You have to make them adhere. The second thing that I wanted to say, you know, in our community, this might not be very visible, like a community, like for example, the America or Canada or in England, where people come from different cultures and there's always minorities. Like I remember when my daughters were in Canada, they were always questioned about, you know, like why in, in their culture they cannot date or why they can go out or what they can party. But I feel, you know, we're blessed here, Jan. <laughs> this is all, that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Hill. Definitely, we should attend to contextual uh, parameters. And uh, as you said, we are not reinventing the wheel here. There are universal values which we all observe as teachers. But um, if you are a critical pedagogue, probably you're, you would push that agenda just a teeny little further, one step at a time. Professor Najib. Yes, thank you, Misan, for um, the interesting presentation. I actually have a couple of comments about the, um, the, the presentation on the critical pedagogy. Um, what I understand, I mean, I looked, to be honest, at several uh, sources here. Um, what you have done is that you put too much pressure on the teacher, on, on us, for example. Um, and what I understand is that the teacher teacher's role actually is to help students question and challenge power, domination, and whatever you call it, even ideologies in, in their classroom and uh, in their uh, community as well. And by the way, I mean, you know that um, uh, critical pedagogy started by the Brazilian Paulo uh, Freire and it actually has um, what we call a Catholic base. It's, it started as a religious uh, movement in Latin America in order to um, challenge the potential, uh, you know, um, war between classes um, and so on. Um, so basically, what this means is that the teacher, of course, we have to be critical of, of our own um, you know, pedagogy of our own way of teaching. Um, but in our culture, actually, we, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm wrong. We tend not to tolerate, um, uh, you know, opposing uh, views. And students are aware of the power gap between us and them. So they're not actually, they're not actually prepared to question uh, your power as a teacher because they know that you have power over you, you, your students. So basically, the teacher, of course, has a role, but the most important thing is to help students to uh, question and challenge some of the uh, ideologies and the mispractices or stereotypes, whatever the, the things that you mentioned. And the example that, I'm, I mean, the, the lyrics that I put at the beginning in the chat uh, from Pink Floyd's song, Another Brick on the Wall, it actually applies to uh, critical pedagogy where students, they don't want dark sarcasm in the classroom. They have to criticize the teacher and they're not just another brick in the wall. They're human beings. They have their own ambitions and, and their, their uh, own ideas. So um, critical pedagogy is not only, um, you know, it, it's not only the task of the teacher, but it's also of the students and students have to be um, like have to, to come from an environment or a culture where opposing views are respected and appreciated. Um, the, the, uh, the points that you mentioned about the Ministry of Education, we talk about equity, of course, this is like it's all political um, things here, right? It's all political um, ideas here. Um, so this is the, the, the comment that I wanted to make. Of course, we have a role is to raise awareness in the classroom and we talk to students, but students actually, they're very shy and they're not actually, you might get some students who actually have that kind of attitude. They come forward and they speak, 
but the majority of our students they keep uh, quiet because they know if they say something deep in their mind it's back in their mind or for the back of their mind that the teacher might actually punish them and um, that's that's what actually puts uh, puts off put them off not uh, doing or you know um, carrying out critical um, analysis or whatever you want to call it yeah okay that's my comment thank you Thank you, Dr. Najib. Uh, I really uh, uh, appreciate the fact that you spoke about uh, critical pedagogy from a historical perspective. There are things you mentioned that I don't know. There are things you mentioned that I chose not to mention. This uh, was a 24 page paper. And uh, it, it's the second thing that was very enriching about your comment, Professor, is the fact that you were talking about criticality from a student perspective. And this is something definitely that we as uh, teachers must reflect on. And finally, for the comment about students being shy, et cetera, yes, this is kind of um, in line with critical pedagogy because my question is what are we as, in, as, as educators going to do about it? Should we do anything at all or should we just let them be shy? You, you can do that or, and you can do this and these are totally acceptable both and yeah. yeah. Uh, absolutely, you know, because we live in a culture, I mean, in this whole culture, it's kind of conservative culture. If students are not able to say or to voice their opinion at home, they carry this over to the classroom, okay, fearing that might something might happen uh, to them. But of course, our role is to encourage them to come forward and talk about their uh, you know, if they have any issue or whatever. And I, as I said, so many students actually come forward and they speak their mind. But the majority, some others, of course, they just don't want to get involved in any kind of uh, discussion. Thank yes. you. Thank you, Dr. Najib. Dr. Sharif and then Majdalin. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Misan, for this uh, informative uh, presentation about critical pedagogy. Um, I have a comment and then a question. Uh, my comment is um, as uh, comes as a follow up uh, to what uh, Professor Najib mentioned about uh, critical pedagogy uh, being uh, um, um, a concept uh, uh, that uh, puts pressure on teachers. My own understanding of this concept is that it uh, frees teacher from the pressure um, that they have. Uh, by by giving by minimizing their role in the classroom and giving uh, students uh, freedom to 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 speak up their um, concerns and also to act uh, because I think you talked about the concepts of particularity possibility and practicality and these are the concepts which emphasize the role of, of learners in the classroom rather than the roles of, of teachers but in the second part of uh, Professor Najib's uh, 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 comment um, he said that we are in a culture, truly, rightly, uh, uh, we are in a culture in which uh, students uh, fear uh, to voice their concerns in the classroom. Um, they are shy, yes, uh, but yeah, to, to practice critical pedagogy, we have to free them uh, from, that, uh, from these uh, constraints. Um, um, so yeah, this is my own understanding of this concept, but uh, the question which I would like you to, to elaborate uh, on is um, the uh, position of the concept of uh, translanguaging in that uh, paradigm of critical pedagogy. Um, is it uh, related? Can we um, practice translanguaging within a uh, critical pedagogy uh, paradigm? Okay, thank you, Dr. Najib. I'm going to listen, because there are only five minutes left, I'm going to listen to Dr. Uh, Majdolin and- uh, Dr. Sharif, not Najib. Dr. Sharif, I said Najib, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, That's I okay. apologize. I'm sorry. I apologize sincerely. Okay, I'm going to listen to Majdulin and Dr. Sami you, and then I will answer. If you don't mind, Dr. Sharif. <laughs> uh, Majdulin, because only five minutes are left, uh, and then it will disconnect. Maybe I don't know what happens. Majdulin, yes. Hi. First of all, I wanted to say thank you, Dr. Misan, for this seminar. Um, I think a lot of just Misan, <laughs> call me Misan, please. Oh. Just <laughs> Go ahead. Um, a lot of these topics that were discussed weren't, um, they're not discussed as frequently and as openly as they should be. Um, so thank you for this seminar. And also, um, I wanted to comment on something that Dr. Najib said. 
um, your comment was very insightful, but uh, I just have one comment. Um, I actually don't agree with the fact that you said that um, this presentation puts too much pressure on the teacher. Um, I believe that the teacher is the most important actor in the classroom. And also you mentioned power structures, how like um, some students might, I guess, see like the power difference between them and the teacher and then not um, not say everything that they would want to say um, or a bit, I, I guess, like suppress themselves because they think that the teacher is um, higher in the hierarchy than them. Um, so I think that just emphasizes just how important it is for the teacher um, to make the class, I guess, more welcoming and also to welcome the shy students, make them feel more at home. Um, um, yeah, so I think the most important actor in the classroom is the teacher. And yeah, thank you. Thank you, Masdulin. Dr. Thamiyu, how are you? Alhamdulillah, I mean, I'm doing well. Thank you so much. And I apologize for joining late. I just finished a class. Uh, but because I'm so passionate about uh, issues of uh, teaching and learning, I thought I would still join no matter what. Uh, much the lane actually spoke my mind. Uh, I feel most of the time we talk about culture. We say, you know, culture dictates this, culture dictates that. It is true, but uh, one thing that I have been, you know, advocating for is for us to acknowledge the fact that culture doesn't make us, we make our culture. And as we evolve, there's nothing really wrong, you know, with our culture, you know, evolving as well. Like uh, Majuline said, uh, it, it's it's um, actually the responsibility of the facilitator. I wish, uh, you know, some of our colleagues who have been saying, uh, no, instructors are the, you know, uh, authority. They know everything. They come into the class. They teach. Students do not need to critique their work nor share their experience. I wish, you know, some of them are in attendance, you know, to listen to this kind of uh, presentation. Um, so again, as I'm, <laughs> uh, it, it's all about the teacher, you know, opening the classroom up, giving the impression that it's okay for students to critique uh, their work. And uh, by doing that, we're also helping them in terms of uh, being able to maintain their job in the future. You don't want uh, learners who will become dogmatic in the future, who will not be able to critique a system, not make, uh, you know, meaningful contributions. Uh, all because, you know, I'm afraid of uh, my maybe chair of my department or I'm afraid of uh, the dean or I'm afraid of uh, this person or that person. So I feel, um, you know, the, the educators have a lot to do. And I wonder whether, you know, there could be a forum where we can talk more about uh, how we can, you know, change our classroom practices, uh, open it up more and um, step back. Uh, you know, serve as uh, guides on the side, allow our learners to take uh, the leadership and ownership of the learning process. And we support by providing, um, you know, uh, feedback when necessary. And we go with uh, ZDP as well, you know, zone of proxima development, allow them to explore and jump in, you know, when necessary. Uh, these are some of the things that I thought I should add to the conversation, but this is a this is a very important topic, and I think uh, it won't be a bad idea to explore it further. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Samiyo, and thank you for the Vygotskyan reference. Actually, a lot of the examples I mentioned, especially those from Golombek and uh, Johnston, adopt a Vygotskyan approach. If you are interested in reading the articles, they are cited. Um, because thank we you. have very little, thank you so much, Dr. Samir. Uh, I will start by addressing Dr. Sharif's question. Uh, I think if I'm not wrong, Dr. Sharif asked, uh, where does translanguaging fall when we talk about critical pedagogy? Translanguaging draws on uh, uh, co cogn cognition of uh, uh, native cognition, or uh, this is how I understand it. I might be mistaken. Uh, translanguaging draws on um, native knowledge or native language knowledge or primary language knowledge to when it comes to, you know, trans language. So to uh, as a resource in learning a new language in learning a new culture attached to a new language or that comes along learning a new language. 
So this is where I believe uh, uh, translanguaging falls when it comes to critical pedagogy. Instead of treating a student's native or primary being as a taboo that doesn't belong in the English classroom, oh no, don't speak Arabic, it's a taboo. We are trying to learn English here. If you wish, and again, I'm not insisting on any of this, it's an option, it's a suggestion that is cited in the literature. It is empowering for a student who is a non-native speaker of language, and this is cited and supported by the literature to feel that they bring their native language and their primary language knowledge to the classroom as an asset or, and as a resource in learning another language. And from personal experience, let me tell you this, this might play against me on any day, but I, I teach English for medical sciences sometimes, and I, I don't use Arabic. I, the problem is that I, I learn these uh, words in English, and I teach them in English, and I don't even know their uh, Arabic equivalents. Equivalents. So I see automatically that when I say something and a student doesn't understand it and asks me, Miss, can you please repeat what uh, Diodino means as a, as a medical combining form? I see another student automatically writing that Arabic word in the chat. And before I even finish explaining what this means in English, the student has already said, oh my God, okay, I get it now. So yes, your native language is a resource. You might choose to use it by translanguaging in the classroom. You might not choose to use it. My understanding of translanguaging may not be uh, accurate because again, all of these are kind of abstract terms. And also translanguaging is kind of relatively uh, uh, new and challenged a lot. So, you know, this is how I think about it uh, to answer Dr. Sharif's question. Would you like to share your thoughts on what I said, Dr. Sharif? Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Misan. Yes, uh, uh, this is uh, absolutely uh, correct in terms of um, the use of the first language being a resource uh, in the second language uh, classroom. Uh, but the concept of translanguaging is about uh, uh, exchanging ideas in the two languages. Uh, so making use of the two languages in the classroom rather than exclusively using one over the other. So this is absolutely correct, and thank you for um, this um, answer. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for your valuable question. Uh, Majdalin, well, the role of the teacher is not an imposition, as I perceive it. So teachers have their own identity. Uh, they are free to, to practice, you know, a lot of institutional, community, cultural pressures define the teacher role, right? So, uh, uh, let's talk realities okay now i don't want to talk theory i want to talk reality maybe i shouldn't be talking at all because time is up but uh, what i would like to say is that Majdulin, until today we have students who refuse to learn except if we speak and they write notes and they record and they so any any uh, uh, more modern approach to education that uh, uh, celebrates the teacher role as a facilitator rather than a speaker who the student is listening to might not really be appreciated, might uh, elicit a lot of complaints and stuff like that. So there is a spectrum, okay? Uh, um, it, it's all about just choosing who you want to become. What's your mission? What's your, your own vision? What, how do you perceive your role? Do you sleep well at night? Are, uh, uh, is your conscience clear? To me, I don't know. It's, it's kind of a lot, you know, it's, it's very broad, this topic of minimizing or maximizing the role of the teacher. I don't know. I, I don't perceive uh, critical pedagogy as neither minimizing nor maximizing. I think it changes the role of the teacher in the class. And it might not be for the better for those who don't choose to adopt it. So again, as I started my presentation, I will end it by saying this is a suggestion, not an imposition. I would like to see a more just world. If in the classroom we can spot these chances or opportunities to draw someone's attention that somebody is doing something not very nice, maybe you would want to choose to address it and maybe you would want to choose to ignore it. And this is completely up to you as an educator and as a human being. There is no imposition here. Majdurin, I will leave the last comment to you. People want to go have dinner. <laughs>
Okay, thank you. Um, there was actually two things that I wanted to mention. Uh, first of all, about translanguaging, I think it could be a really useful tool because, for example, at home in a family, for example, that speaks both Arabic and English, I think that each language has um, a set of things that it can express that no other language can express. So when you're using more than one language to express your feelings, I think it gives you, um, I guess it makes it makes your scope of um, like the things that you can cover with your feelings wider. I hope that makes sense. Um, so I think that could also be um, taken advantage of in the classroom. Uh, second thing that I wanted to discuss is the role of the teacher as a facilitator instead of um, as like lecturing and everyone else is taking notes. Um, I actually had a class with Dr. Sami last semester um, and it was very new to me in the sense that um, instead of it being a traditional classroom where the teacher would lecture and everyone else would just take notes. It was more of very discussion based and the, the teacher took on the role of a facilitator. Um, it was very new, um, but it and it did take some getting used to. But then by the end of the semester, um, the students were like, they were able to use like more than one type of, um, how do I say this? Um, the students had like, like more than one type of lecturing that they were that they could respond to, I guess. So yeah, even though it was new, it did take some time getting used to. Um, it was a very good experience, I think, and it allowed like the students more chance to talk and more chance to influence like what was discussed in class. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to hear that. So I'm very grateful for everybody who attended. Uh, I, I hope you enjoyed this presentation, even if just for the sake of entertainment, some sort of academic entertainment, a new genre maybe that I'm just introducing. And uh, good night, everyone, I guess. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Misan. Thank you for Thank attending, you. everyone. You, and see you uh, next, I think next week, Professor Muhammad's webinar. As-salamu, good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank you.